Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everybody doing? The world is upside down and people are going crazy. And that's all I'm going to say about that because YouTube has started to delete comments again for no reason. Especially whenever they take a screenshot of the comment and there's nothing literally in the screenshot. So I don't know what's going on. Weird. Happened to me yesterday. So that's all I'm going to say because they're probably going to try to, the algorithm's probably going to try to say I, I said something I shouldn't have said by saying something about the rest of the world. <laughs> it's nonsense. I'll really be glad when, as far as I'm concerned, they can take this current administration out and go ahead and put Trump and his cabinet in and get it over with. If you don't like who's captaining the ship, you don't drill holes in the ship you're riding on. And that's what's happening. Just 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 just, just think about that. If you're captaining the ship and you're out in the ocean and a new captain is going to take over, and you don't like that. You don't drill holes in the boat you're riding in. Because everybody's going down. It doesn't make sense. Anyway. And if you've been watching any of the news sources the last few days, you know you're seeing what I'm seeing. Romans 11.36 is our verse. To whom be glory forever. Amen. And this is going to be our encouragement for just such a time as this. The whole verse says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is our all in all. We talked about this yesterday. So let's go up here. <coughs> um, let's see. All right, we'll start here in verse 25. The mystery of Israel's salvation. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The Lord hasn't forgotten about Israel, but they have received a, a form of blindness to the truth so that we might be able to come into the Lord. God will come and will finish dealing with Israel. That day is coming. That will be the tribulation, That's which is why it's called Jacob's trouble. We have not replaced Israel. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now keep in mind, not all of Israel shall be saved. The, the, we read that in Zechariah. He says one third of Israel will be saved. That's Jacob. So this is what's going to happen. This is the plan he's going to do. Because a large portion of them, just like a large portion of the rest of the world, is going to turn and go after the evil one, and they're going to be they're going to get dealt with. But the Lord will save his people. Verse 28. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. That's the truth. They're enemies so that we might come into the gospel. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Again, the church has not replaced Israel. There are a lot of people that think this. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. You cannot remove yourself nor be removed from the salvation of God. That includes Israel. You know, they were there first, not us. I mean, technically we were, but we weren't in salvation. But the Jews were pulled out of that line through Abraham and made a different line. We have salvation because of the Jews. So how can we think we've replaced them? It's impossible. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now, or have now, obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient. That through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. So here's the incredible story 
in its most, you know, generic form. Dogs are going crazy on something. Um, everybody's Gentile in the beginning. Abraham is pulled off and a new line is made. And it's Israel that comes out of, the, of out of his lineage. So you have those guys and then you have, you have Jews and you have Gentiles. The Jews wander from the faith. A savior comes out of them, reaches out to them. They deny him. So he reaches out to the Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles both join in Christ. And then in the end, salvation comes again to both Jews and Gentiles. And we have a, a group of people that come out of both lineages, not, not counting the church. If it wasn't for God pulling Abraham off and making a new line of people to bring Israel out of, to bring Jesus out of, we wouldn't have Jesus for our salvation. Let me go see what these dogs are barking at. They're going crazy. I guess the squirrel was messing with them. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. If God chose the Jews, he's going to finish doing what he's doing with the Jews. If God chose the Gentiles to be saved, we can't be unsaved. That one verse right there blows all those arguments out of the water. But clearly the Lord isn't done with Israel yet. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. Isn't it funny that Jesus Christ comes out of the Jewish lineage, reaches out to them, and they deny him? So, okay, he reaches out to us. We're like, yeah, well, we're happy to. Thank you. And then we end up being the ones to preach the gospel to them, to bring them to the Lord. How funny is that? Now, there are even Jews who get saved that preach, and the Jews tend to listen to Jews more. But many of us have reached back to them, and, and, and even us reaching out and getting some Jews to the Lord to be saved. And then they are inspired to go back. How funny is it that the Lord used Israel to bring Jesus into the world, and then used us to bring Jews back to Jesus? Isn't that funny? That's amazing. Just goes to show his love and mercy and the way he does things. For God has committed them to all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. A lot of people say God doesn't use bad things to do things. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, steer us into those directions. Well, that verse literally says that. Sometimes that's what we need to bring us around. Also, it creates a greater opportunity for him to show grace and mercy. Is it not beneficial for the Lord to take one of us and lead us into a situation that's bad for us, that he may, uh, may give us greater mercy and greater grace? It brings more glory to his name. Now, it's not that he walks us over to a den of sin and says, there you go, go get it. But he doesn't stop us. And the greater opportunity for him to show us mercy has been created. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And that is probably the most powerful verse in this chapter. Oh, the depth of the wisdom, riches of wisdom. Riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We can't understand it. We can try. We can't. But, but to touch on that, he creates a new line of people called Israelites. He brings a Messiah out of them. They reject that Messiah. That Messiah comes to the Gentiles. The Messiah sends the Gentiles back to the Jews to bring them to him for salvation. And then sends them, after they get saved, back to, to Israel to save more. Amazing. It's amazing. The, the, the very fact that he would save any of us. And we look at our lives and we're like, Lord, how could you possibly save me? Because I know more than you. <laughs> Just relax and be happy. And then sends us to talk to them. The ones who denied him. Oh, no, that's not him. Have you read Isaiah 53? No, Isaiah 53 is lost. Uh, no, we haven't. Read it. 
See for yourself. That's your Messiah. And he died for you 2,000 years ago. He came, was rejected, was crucified, died, was buried, ascended, arose and ascended, and sits at the right hand of judgment. And he's calling to you right now to be saved as one of his chosen. What an honor it is to become a Christian as a Gentile, but then be sent in some way or be a part of the message being delivered back to the very people he came to save in the first place. Amazing. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? None of us. Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? None of us. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. I don't think there's anything past this. Yeah, there is. But it's a different context. Amazing. Amazing. To whom be, God, be glory forever. This should be the single desire of the Christian. All of their wishes must be subservient to, or subservient and tributary to this one. The Christian may wish for prosperity in his business, but only so far as it may help him to promote this. To him be glory forever. He may desire to attain more gifts and more graces, but it should only be that to him may be glory forever. You are not acting as you ought to do when you are moved by any other motive than a single eye to your Lord's glory. This is why we live in a way that glorify the Lord. As a Christian, you are of God and through God. Then live to God. Let nothing ever set your heart beating so mightily as to love him, as love to him. Let this ambition fire your soul. Be this the foundation of every enterprise upon which you enter. And this your sustaining motive whenever your zeal would grow chill. Make God your only object. Depend upon it. Where self begins, sorrow begins. But if God be my supreme delight and only object, quote, to me tis equal whether love or deign, my life or death, appoint me ease or pain. Let your desire for God's glory be a growing desire. If our desire is to glorify God, then the life we live will tend towards glorifying God. An unbeliever cannot do that. Only a believer can do that. You blessed him in your youth. Do not be content with such praises as you gave him then. Has God prospered you in business? Give him more as he has given you more. Has God given you experience? Praise him by stronger faith than you experienced at first. Does your knowledge grow? Then sing more sweetly. Do you enjoy happier times than you once had? Have you been restored from sickness? And has your sorrow been turned into peace and joy? Then give him more music, put more coals, and more sweet frankincense into the censer of your praise. Practically, in your life, give him honor, putting the amen to this doxology to your great and gracious Lord by your own individual service and increasing holiness. Live a life that glorifies God. Simple. You wonder where I got that from? I got it from here. I got it from the Bible. And we read devotions that talk about the same thing. Evidence of salvation. I got it from the Bible. These devotions prove that. A born-again believer, if they're truly born again and truly growing, can't help but express these things physically. Because if the growing, let's say your inner man is spiritual, your outer man is flesh. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell with your inner man. They, Those two together war against the outer man. And so over time, the outer man is going to get tired. It's a great thing about getting old and getting sick and getting weak. <laughs> is the, the outer man can't fight as much against the inner man. Well, the inner man grows stronger. And so the inner man eventually will start to overshadow the outer man. And so who you are on the inside will express outside. Now, some people try to hide that. Some people try to, to hide who they really are. But you can't do it forever. If I'm really a Christian, it's going to express externally. There will be evidence that I am converted that will show in my daily life and in my mannerisms and my interactions with others. 
We can't help it. To say we can is irresponsible. And it's to ignore the very scriptures we read daily. And so we should be glad that who we are as a Christian is expressed externally. That our Father in us, our Lord Jesus Christ in us, his spirit dwelling within us, can be visible and viewable by the people around us. That should make us happy. Because that's just one of the indicators that tells us we're his. But someone who isn't born again can't do this. It's impossible for them to do this. They can try to fake it, and we see many that do that. But the reality of it is, they can't. They just can't. It can be hard to accept it because we've been taught to ignore these things. We've been taught to suppress these things. But what better way? What more consistent way? Because that this is what I was taught. You know, you 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 don't save save your church self for Sunday. The rest of the week you just be normal like everybody else. That's what I was taught. No, I can be a Christian all the time. I was called a holy roller because I was a Christian every day. I'm a Christian every day. That's who I literally am. It's not a holy roller. It's called living to glorify God. It can be hard to come to that conclusion. But should I not desire to live every day to glorify him? And if I do that, should it be evidenced? Should we see it? Of course we should. Something should be different about us. And it's to the praise and glory of his holy name that that happens. If I have Christ dwelling within me, there is no way I can stay the exact same person I used to be. Let's be the people we're being made to be. Let's be those bright lights sitting set on top of a bushel, not hidden under it. Let your light shine. Because who we are on the inside, people need to see it. Because if they talk to somebody who says they're a Christian, but they look at how they act, because the first thing they're going to do is do a visual assessment of you, and they don't see anything that says Christian, well, you look like the rest of us. They're not going to believe anything you say. There's no credibility to it. But if you truly are changed, and it is expressed externally, and they see that, I can look and see that you are different, that you truly believe this, that you are a follower of Christ. And we've done devotion after devotion about this. We've read verse after verse about this. But there are still people that fight this. Let them see you're a believer. They don't like it. That's tough. They'll get over it. Let them see. Let them see Christ in you. And let them give him glory. Does not the verses say, um, do your works in full view of, of, of everyone. That way they can glorify God for your good works. Let them do it. Let them see it. Show them who Jesus Christ is by being a living example of that, a living sacrifice. The glorious Lord who has done all this, who has orchestrated this incredible event, thousands of years in the making, he is worthy of all glory. And we should be the people that say, to whom be glory forever, amen, to the one and only Lord Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior of all mankind. We should be the people. He gets the glory. Hey, this is a great thing that you did. I really appreciate it. Give God the glory. He's the one that orchestrated this. I did that with that fire that them people had. I, in fact, I saw the guy that we thought was in the house and wasn't. He was at work and he came, came back. He came by yesterday. We talked to him. Super, super nice guy. They were all talking about that stuff. Um, I told him, I said, give God the glory. Because he's the one that orchestrated this. Because this was not supposed to go the way it went. I'm an, I'm a, an hour late getting out here from when I was normally going to get out here. If I hadn't have, it would have been a whole different story. Literally, 10 more minutes would have decided everything. 
kid you not. And if you saw the evidence, you, it would blow your mind. You'd be like, really? It, it was that close to possibly two, maybe more lives being lost in, a, in, a, in the adjacent house. Give God the glory. To whom be glory forever. Amen. He saved us on the cross on Calvary 2,000 years ago, and that was a plan that was started millennia before the earth was even formed. The scriptures tell us this. To whom be glory forever. Amen. He's the one that protects us, provides for us, watches out for us, leads us, guides us, teaches us, comforts us, strengthens us, encourages us, on and on and on and on and on. To whom be glory forever. Amen. How can we not give glory to our one true God? As believers, that should be the first thing we do. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. I am... The first word that pops to my head is aghast. I am aghast at the world and the way people ignore you. Now, the way the world is today, okay, it's understandable. Most people are, and, and what's terrible about it is, those even going to church on Sunday and calling themselves Christians join in with the rest of them. They do everything they can to deny you. Your people hide who they are, for the most part, not everybody, but a large portion, hide who they are. Some for legitimate circumstances, some just because they're embarrassed, because they don't want to be named or labeled or targeted as a believer. And a small remnant that stands out there and says, oh, yeah, I'm a believer. I have no problem people knowing it. In every situation, you get the glory, even if it's one where somebody tries to hide, because ultimately they'll come to you. Ultimately, they reach out to you. And we know by reading the scriptures that there's times where you will lead us to those places so that more mercy may be given, more glory may be had. The goal is to glorify your name. And, and you do this in such an amazing, intricate, grand fashion. Using the subtlest of means. How can we not stop and say, to whom be glory forever, amen? How can we not? In the details run, I, I, it would take me a year to even touch on the details surrounding this from scripture and from personal experiences. If I spoke eight hours a day, it would take me a year just to talk about all the little details. And that's just scratching the surface. That's not even getting into the, the whole grand scheme of it. And then there's things we don't know, the things that happened before this reality was created, before the earth was formed. It would take a million people, a million lifetimes to speak it all out. How can we not give you glory, Father? How can we not give you glory, Lord Jesus? Look what you did. Came down from heaven. In the ultimate act of humility, was born as a human male. Walked this earth. Ran a ministry. Died, was buried, and rose again, and ascended to the Father. To save mankind, you gave your life to save mankind. Amazing. Incredible. Astounding. And then you go and you walk with us every single baby step we take in our lives. You walk with us every step. You're there. Paying attention to the fine details, things that we miss. We go mow the grass. All right, the grass looks good. You follow along with us. We just mowed the grass. Hey, it looks fine. You saw what angle the blade cut the, the blade of grass. You saw how the, 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 the grass was pulled up and thrown out of the mower. You saw where it landed and how it composted back into the ground as nutrients to feed the grass that was there. And then you saw how the grass started growing again. You saw details we don't even know. We didn't even pay attention to. The 
Lord, may we give you the glory you are worthy of, the glory you deserve, especially as your people. And may we do it every day, in every situation, for any reason, give you the glory because you are the glory. So again, I end this prayer with, to whom be glory forever, amen, forever and ever, all generations, all lifetimes, may you get the glory. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for this free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. Glorify the Lord. Give glory to the Lord. Give credit to the Lord. Because the more we learn and the more we see and the more we study and the more we live, the more we understand. That was all because of him. Give him the glory. That was all because of him. This was all because of him. Give him the glory. Give him the glory and we give thanks. What an amazing day. Amazing day to be saved, to be in Jesus Christ, and to be able to live to give him glory. In this very video, we're doing it. I know some of y'all are nodding your head saying amen. Give God the glory. We have a president. A president that is going to radically change the course of this country. Maybe for a short time. Who knows? Give God the glory. That the day that we're just now starting will be a good day. Give God the glory. Lord, thank you for a good day. Amazing. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.